What's up, everybody? This is Trey Biddy with Hogsports.com, H-A-W-G-Sports.com. Back after a week off, took a little trip to New York City for spring break. Maybe the first spring break t- trip I've taken since uh, Panama City, 1998. But uh, took the family out there, so didn't have the show last week. But glad to be back because we've got plenty to talk about with Razorback football, spring practice resuming. Uh, we'll talk about some of the things that we saw in the first five practices, some of the things we're expecting to see in the next 10 practices. And of course, there's basketball, baseball, plenty of other things to discuss. And we'll take your questions as well today. All that more on today's episode of Hogsports Live. And before we get started, of course, I want to remind you there's plenty of ways to watch and listen. You can always tune in on Facebook Live, where we're always live streaming this show. Be one of 90,000 Razorbacks fans to follow the page if you haven't done so already. Also available on YouTube. Subscribe to that channel and hit the notifications bell also so you're alerted anytime we upload new videos. Subscribe and follow both of those pages. Interact with both of the videos. Share the content with somebody if you think they might enjoy it also and they're not aware of the show. Also available on Apple Podcasts. Throw us that five-star review if you haven't done so already. And say something nice about the show. Let us know what to expect if you don't want to leave a five-star review then i guess leave a leave another review but we'd love to have the five-star review from you also available on spotify stitcher anywhere else you can think of five favorite podcast hog sports just one dollar right now for your first month at hawg sports and it's an important time to sign up because portal season is here Portal season is here for college basketball, and uh, there's a lot of names that are going out there. Obviously, Curtis was out in Las Vegas. I hope all of you enjoyed his coverage. Uh, If you haven't checked out his channel on Hog Hoops Live, uh, then go back and check out some of the live spots he did um, out from Las Vegas and, um, you know, uh, of course, Des Moines, Idaho. I want to say Iowa again. Des Moines, Idaho, um, he was out there and, and just really had tremendous coverage of everything going on with Razorback basketball and hope he's enjoying a little bit of downtime. He, I, I guess, probably come back yesterday or maybe come back today uh, from Las Vegas enjoying some uh, Elite Eight game action. So go follow all that stuff. We're not going to talk a whole lot of recruiting stuff. Danny's got a lot of information out there about visitors and stuff. Uh, we're not going to talk a whole lot about basketball because of Curtis's content is, is out there and, and – uh, and obviously he covered it with the Hog Hoops Live show. Hog Hoops Live is on a different YouTube channel. It's on the same Facebook page, same podcast channel, but a different YouTube page. So go ahead and search for that when this show is over and check out some of his content. I promise you're going to enjoy that. So the last time we saw Arkansas football, 36 live scrimmage plays. Okay, that was the fifth practice. That was Thursday before last, right before they took off for spring break. Uh it was inside, unfortunately. Obviously, you'd like to see scrimmages outside, but it was inside the Walker Pavilion because of weather. But uh, I've got all the stats broken down. They did 12 live plays with the ones, 12 live plays with the twos, 12 live plays with the threes. They also did, what, like 15 non-tackle scrimmage plays um, and then did another, I think, 12 total um Skelly plays down at the goal line. I've got every single play broken down, how far it went, stats broken down. You can check all that out at Hog Sports. But uh, just to go over stuff real quick, K.J. Jefferson had him 5 of 8 for 68 yards. This is just in the live stuff, just in the live stuff out of the 12 live plays they ran. Raheem Sanders only – what – he had, uh, excuse me, four for, for 28. I'll say this is interesting. This gives you a little bit of insight about Arkansas's backfield. So, A.J. Green comes in with the third team offense against the third team defense. Now, keep in mind, the first time the play was run, this was literally the first time a lot of these guys have ever tackled in a Razorback uniform. Some walk-ons, some true freshmen. And you have A.J. Green as the running back. He goes 62 yards on the first play. 62 yards on the first play with the third-team offense against the third-team defense. Again, first time they've ever tackled. Like, they didn't do any, like, full live tackle drills. They did some, like, thudding up and stuff before the practice started. But Sam Pittman wanted to get some live tackle in stuff before they went to spring. It was the first day in full pads. Usually you see first day in full pads, there's like a – you know, they'll go through practice and just kind of wearing the pads and popping and stuff before they do a, a full scrimmage stuff. So, um, pretty rare to see that. But uh, you can read up all on, on all that. I'm going to go over some of the, you know, some of my individual opinions on some guys. But first, I want to, um, you know, just talk about, you know, what's coming up with with, with spring football. Uh, they'll resume on Tuesday. I think that's a 340 practice. We should get about an hour of open uh, periods. Not sure what the uh, 
protocol is now for uh, post-practice interviews. I, I assume we'll talk to Sam Pittman since it's a first day back, but I assume we'll talk to him, maybe a couple of players. Haven't talked to a whole lot of guys just yet through those first five practices. There's 107 players on this spring roster, 46 returning scholarship players, 12 true freshmen, early enrollees, 10 scholarship transfer additions, and 10 brand new walk-ons. Of those 46 who are remaining, as I mentioned, they're scholarship players. Uh, the rest of the guys are, that are on the roster are returning walk-ons. So that's who's back. So they'll go Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday is actually a closed practice. I assume they're going to scrimmage uh, in an enclosed environment on Saturday. But Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, they'll follow that routine, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, until the last week. Last week, uh, they mix it up a little bit. Let's see, I've got it right here. So the last week, they will go. That's the 11th, 13th, 14th, and 15th. Um, so that's a Tuesday, the 11th. That'll be practice 12. 13 will be um, Thursday. 14 will be Friday. And then 15th is the red-white spring game. That is in, at, noon, on, at noon on Saturday, the 15th. Uh, also mixed in between here on Wednesday, two days from now, today's Monday for those watching maybe later, on Wednesday you have Arkansas Pro Day. And what I think is interesting about this is we're a good bit removed now from the NFL Combine, which is a good thing because last year, I don't know why they did this, maybe it was just the way the schedule worked out, but last year they had the NFL Combine, and then I swear it was the next week they had uh, Arkansas Pro Day which doesn't make a whole lot of sense to do because, you know, in a lot of things, you know, if you go to the NFL Combine, you you test in certain events. Maybe there's other events you hold off on and you wait to do them at the pro day. Maybe you want to do the 40 or the bench press, you know, at a different time. But this doesn't give you a whole – that didn't give you a whole lot of time to prepare and change, you know, your mindset going from the Combine, you know, to this where you would do different events. So now they've changed things up. Maybe they learned from that and have pushed that out a little bit. So – Pro Day is on Wednesday, the 29th. Today's the 27th. We're showing this show. But four of the five practices um, were open to the media in the first five. I think all of them are scheduled to be open to the media except for the April 1st scrimmage coming up out of the remaining 10 practices. Still hosting recruits. Been a big, busy time for uh, for hosting recruits. And they've got more scheduled to come in this month. So April 17th, after spring practice is over, just to give you a preview of a few dates coming up, after the spring wraps up, uh, Arkansas will probably take some time, maybe meet with some of the players and stuff, Maybe give the coaches a little bit of a break. Uh, but starting April 17th, the coach, uh, assistant coaches, not head coaches, the assistant coaches are allowed to go out on the road for the spring evaluation period. They have 42 days to get in 168 days. The way that works out, we've explained that on this show before, but it is confusing because of the way the wording is. But if there are seven assistant coaches that go out on the road in one calendar day, that counts as seven days, if that makes sense. So you have 42 days to get 168 days in. Shouldn't be a problem at all to get all those opportunities in. In fact, they'll probably wrap up before those 42 days. Also starting April 1st, programs are allowed to welcome in recruits for official visits. That period uh, runs through June 27th, aside from certain dates here and there. May 1st marks the start of what will be a tumultuous 15-day transfer portal window. That runs through May 15th. Two weeks. Two weeks of craziness there'll be some guys at Arkansas that leave there'll be players that are like you know I don't like my new position coach or I thought I was going to be at this spot but they brought a transfer in where do I fit in all kinds of things like that will happen so it'll happen at Arkansas it'll happen at other schools obviously Arkansas I've got them at 77 scholarship players right now they can have 85 so there's a lot of work to be done in the transfer portal remaining. There are players in the transfer portal right now. Obviously, we saw with Jaheim Singletary committing to Arkansas, but there are players in the transfer portal right now um, who don't have a home. And maybe they they pluck some of those guys. They certainly have offered some of those guys, brought some of those guys in for visits. 
Obviously, Singletary came in for a visit. So it's not just those guys in that last two weeks. There's also going to be players who enter the transfer portal or say they're entering the transfer portal. Just because it opens on May 1st doesn't mean you can't say, hey, I'm going to enter the transfer portal. It's just you can't get in there until May 1st, but you can let everybody know I'm entering it. So you'll see some of that stuff too. Not I'm not saying like necessarily at Arkansas, but you'll see that stuff. Who's who's impressed me so far? Jacoby Criswell. Jacoby has. Uh, I like what I see out of him. Six one two twenty five. I would say maybe he's got the strongest arm on the team. Throws a nice crisp tight spiral every single time. He was two of four passing for twenty seven yards against the second and third team defenses in that scrimmage. Criswell can run. He can throw. I think he's got a future. I think he's going to be the the next guy at Arkansas after K.J. Jefferson. I think K.J. will leave after the 2023 season, even though he technically has one year of eligibility left due to the COVID forgiven year in 2020. But I think this will be the last year we see K.J. Jefferson. And then I think you'll see uh, Jacoby Criswell step in there. And I think he could do a good job. Colby, uh, Jacoby sat behind Sam Howell, who was drafted by the Washington Commanders. He sat behind them for two years. And then last year he sat behind Drake May, who may end up being the number one overall pick in the 2024 NFL draft. Looking ahead. And if he play, if Jefferson goes to the NFL, that could be three, <laughs> three NFL quarterbacks that Jacoby Criswell has played behind. Uh, I just like the, uh, the way he looks out there. I mean, it's it doesn't take long to – Figure out if you like the way a guy looks, especially when they're playing a skill position or quarterback position. Um, and I like what I've seen so far. Looking at the younger group, I would say the guy that jumps out to me the most has been Luke Haz. Luke Haz is the smallest tight end out there, 6'3", 227. I wouldn't let it fool you. 226, that's what he's listed at officially. I would not let his size fool you. It's not like he's way smaller. Like there are other guys out there that are 6'4", you know, uh, just listed as the smallest. But, um, you know, kind of maybe in the more of a mold of like Brock Bowers, um, who's not that much bigger probably. So, has – can really pop you. Like, he's explosive for – a 226-pound guy, like, he will pop you. Now, I'm not saying that he's going to line up as an inline tight end a whole lot, but um, split out, sniffer, H-back type, I think you could see that a lot from him next year, and I think you're going to see it a lot. I think they're going to play him a good bit. Um, and a lot of that's due to numbers. Like, I like Jalen Braxton also, but the reason I'm not talking about Jalen Braxton so much is because you got, you know, Quincy McAdoo, Dwight McLaughlin, James Singletary, Ladarius Bishop coming back when he gets healthy. Um, you know, you've got a lot of Lorando Johnson. I mean, you've got a lot of cornerbacks. So, this, that's going to be a tough rotation to crack for a true freshman, although I think he's got a really bright future. Has, on the other hand, I mean, you could see him rise pretty quick to the top two or so in the depth chart. Uh, you got Nathan Bax there. Bax is more of a blocker type, not an explosive – weapon in the passing game. Um, Tyrus Washington, who I think can be, you know, a good player in terms of the passing game and also, you know, has a little bit more experience. Um, but they run a lot of two tight end sets too. They're not just working two tight end sets for no reason right at the start of – I mean, they came out in a two tight end set. You know, they're still installing. They'll install till about practice 10. But they came out in a two tight end set and have been working that a lot. They've also come out in – um, you know, like 21 personnel with two backs, which we saw them do in the Liberty Bowl. So they're installing stuff, and they'll continue to do that. But uh, they obviously think that they're going to be in decent shape at tight end, even though the numbers kind of stink right now. They're, the numbers aren't great at tight end, in my opinion. Um, they're okay, but in terms of, like, guys I would say are play like they're getting Shamar Easter in, okay? He's going to be a little bit behind because he's not enrolling until the summer. I think if it were me, I would add another veteran tight end, I think. But I really like the way Luke has looked so far. And I haven't seen them use like a whole lot of inline tight ends, to be honest. So, Luke has so far, I would say, out of everybody, the newcomers, the freshmen, I should say, not just the newcomers, the freshmen, I would say he's probably at the top of my list right now. As far as everybody coming back, Lorando Johnson looks good. Trajan Jeffcoat looks good. John Morgan looks good. 
Antonio Greer, Jacoby Criswell. They're some good-looking players, and that's not even to mention the three wide receivers that they brought in. Um, you know, that always makes me think, too. Like, people talk about NIL money and bringing in recruits and stuff. And, you know, we saw with basketball, which has been – you know, the NCAA tournament is obviously wild. But to me, it makes a lot more sense if you're spending NIL money to spend it on old dudes, guys that have proven themselves, guys that have played in college, versus spending on a lot of recruits. Now, I'm not saying you don't do that some. There's going to be a balance. But, you know, with Arkansas, like, you know, and, and maybe things would have been different if Nick Smith had been healthy longer. Um, but, like, you look at some of these teams out there that the parity that we see in, in college basketball now, just looking at the Final Four alone for that. But you can get veteran real quick. And that's something that Musselman has done in his career at, at Arkansas and at Nevada. But you can – Instead of like like it used to be, you know, ten years ago, John Calipari or Mike Shashevsky or some, you know, those guys, they could put a team of five stars together, and you know, make an NCAA tournament run, peak at the right time, late in the season, and make a run. But now those young teams with five stars, which you know, those guys eventually will be great. They have a high ceiling, but right now when it matters, it's the veteran teams. It's the teams that you know. It used to be teams that stayed together for four years and or three years, and now it's like teams that you assemble. Those are the teams that are meshing and peaking at the right time. A lot of in a lot of cases, not in all cases, but in a lot of cases, it seems like Arkansas always runs into a buzzsaw in the NCAA tournament, doesn't it? One day maybe Arkansas will be that buzzsaw, but you know, last year it was North Carolina, Baylor. The year before that, this year it's UConn. I think I think UConn wins it all. I think UConn wins it all. I think the funniest tweet that I saw was like uh, Kansas should thank Arkansas for saving <laughs> saving them the embarrassment of of getting destroyed by UConn, and they beat the crap out of Gonzaga right after the right after Arkansas. Anyway, back to spring. Arkansas's got some puzzles to work in the secondary. I mean. You've got three new coaches, obviously. Travis Williams, the overall defensive coordinator. Marcus Woodson, co-defensive coordinator, really in charge of the secondary. And then Darren Wilson, who's kind of in a way his assistant. You know, they don't have defined roles as safeties coach and cornerbacks coach. Marcus and Darren work it together. But they've got to, they've got to mix some things up. I think you could probably see some corners moving to safety. It's not like the old days where all the safeties are 215 pounds and stuff. It's, you know, they're – Corners are bigger, and safeties are about the same size these days. So figure it out some kind of way. I think Al Walcott, who is 215, you know, for the, for that nickel spot, you do probably need a guy that's a little bit bigger. It's a tough position to play because you got to be able to cover slot receivers. you got to be able to play run support. It's a tough spot. You're gonna, you are you got to be able to take on blockers. Uh, but Walcott, when he gets healthy, 6'2", 215, I think he's going to fit at that nickel spot. And then after that – you know, Jaheim Singletary, Lorando Johnson, Ladarius Bishop, Dwight McLaughlin, and Quincy McAdoo. I mean, where do you where do you fit those guys in? You got to get your best five out there. So whatever that looks like, if it's safeties or not, you also got Hudson Clark, Malik Chavis, Jalen Lewis has been doing. Jalen Lewis has been starting mostly. Uh, at the nickel spot, they've also worked Hudson Clark. I don't think that – I don't think Hudson Clark has quite the weight that you want there. But maybe against certain teams. Maybe against certain teams that like to air it out. Maybe he's an option there. Jaden Johnson's another guy I didn't mention. Um, but, like, Malik Chavis, Chavis, Hudson Clark, Jaden Johnson, are those guys your answer at safety? I'm not sure that they are. Um, you know, they talk about Chavis having all the ability in the world. He just needs more confidence. You know, Clark, I think, is a good player. He, he catches a lot of criticism, maybe less now that he's at safety versus cornerback. You know, Jaden Johnson, I thought, took a step back last year from where he was the year before. Maybe he needs to put on more weight because he lost a lot of weight. He lost like 20-something pounds, 20 pounds, I think, from 
his first year to his second. So no doubt that they'll do some work in the transfer portal and explore safeties. They need a couple safeties. They need a couple of defensive tackles. They've got room to work. In some case, that may just mean taking a guy to be taking a guy. Even though Sam Pittman says we're not going to take a guy to take a guy. They've got so many slots open. Are there going to be enough guys out there for them? you got to be able to get through practices. Brings me over to the offensive line. Arkansas has got some experimentation that they're doing and, and they're going to continue to do. I've said before, the way I like it, I could see it possibly playing out. I think, I think they're a little guard heavy. And I think they're a little light and inexperienced. That's probably obvious. They lost their two starting tackles from last year. It's not me saying anything um, groundbreaking. But out of the guards, I think that Latham – and I actually thought that they would move Latham last year. And they ended up – you know, Luke Jones ended up starting. But I like Latham moving to left tackle. And if you do that, then that opens up I, – I like Takias Crawford at guard better than tackle personally. Now, they're going to experiment with all that, obviously, and they'll – figure it out probably better than I could. Uh, but just based on what I've seen, I like Takiyas at guard. I like Joshua Braun at guard. And I know that he would prefer to play guard over tackle. So maybe you end up with a situation where you have um, where you have Brady Latham at left tackle, Josh Braun at maybe left guard, Takiyas Crawford at right guard. Obviously, Bo Lemmers, that's pretty well set in stone as the center. They need to find backup center. They need to find some other guys that can snap um, also. And then right tackle, you you know, you've got some battles. Um, is it Devon Manuel? Which I'm told that he will work some right tackle in these next 10 practices. He didn't work any. He only worked on the left side prior to this. But Devon Manuel, um, Andrew Chambly, and Marion Harris, let those guys kind of battle it out for that right tackle spot. And maybe Takias Crawford battles in there too at right tackle. Uh, I also didn't mention Patrick Kudis, who I think could be maybe like the surprise guy on the offensive line. Like maybe people didn't expect him to start, and he does. We've seen him work a lot at, at with the first group, but, you know, look for him to possibly push at one of the guard spots for a starting spot. Like not just a backup role or six man or any of that stuff, but like possibly start. Like that that should not surprise you if, if it ends up being Kudis. So, I think the next group, you know, you've got, you know, Cole Carson, Terry Wells, Eli Henderson, Josh Street, Brooks Edmondson, Tommy Varhill, Varhall, who's the transfer from Maryland, walk on. Um, you know, the young guys, Luke Brown's been out. Luke Brown's going to be a good player. He's going to be a good player when he gets healthy, but he had a knee issue. Patrick Patterson is big. Joey Sue is big, dude. Um, not quite as tall as Patrick Patterson, but uh, – it's a good-looking young group, I think. Luke Brown obviously hadn't been practicing, but just from what I hear about from him and, you know, what I saw in his video from coming out of high school, Luke Brown to me is a guy that will be a really good player here at Arkansas. Where should we go next? Arkansas should stop returning kickoffs. I did a little research into this. Uh, Arkansas should stop returning kickoffs because it – never works out. I mean, unless you got like like a superstar back there. Ladetric Griffin at uh, Mississippi State or back in 2010 Patrick Peterson or something like that. But the last several years all they've done is made moves to stop you from returning kicks. Like 2010, 2013, 2018 there were all significant rule changes. I've broken all this down, um, and it doesn't mention the times that A.J. Green made the right choice and didn't return it. But out of like the seven, I think nine times he returned it, eight times he shouldn't have. And that the only time was like when he fielded at like the 30-yard line. I've got a nice, interesting, long article on that if you want to read further on it. I don't want to go into it too too much, but it is – I think, interesting on why it makes zero sense for you to ever return a kickoff. Plus you – and I've broken down basically every single one of his returns. I think it was seven returns that he had. But, like, 2010, they outlawed wedge blocking, which was huge. Um, 2013, they moved the ball from the 30 
to the 35 to hopefully get more kicks into the end zone. And then 2018, they said you could take it at the 25 if it hit in the end zone or if you fair caught it inside the inside the 25. So, or is it inside the 20? Inside the 20 or the 25? It's really inside the 25. Anyway, um, yeah, it makes no sense. Like, and so the reason I, I bring this up is because on Tuesday, I believe, or was it Wednesday? No, Thursday. I believe Thursday during in the live scrimmage stuff, they spent like 10 minutes working on kickoff return, which isn't something you see very often in the spring. Usually they work on punt um, and field goal teams, and that's pretty much it in the spring. Those are, I mean, those are the two most, those are like the two biggest areas where like things could go badly wrong. So you spend extra time working on punt and, 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 um, field goal extra point. So they spent like 10 minutes working on it. And I'm just thinking all they should be doing now is teaching these guys to fair catch. They shouldn't be working on running it out. None of that, especially in the spring. It felt like it was kind of a waste of their time. Real quick on Arkansas baseball, went one and two in Baton Rouge. Follow Andrew Ellis's coverage. He was down in Baton Rouge for the series, um, nine three on Friday, and then a doubleheader on Saturday. Lost twelve two and fourteen five. Next up is Omaha on Tuesday, March twenty eighth. That's a six p.m. game, and then a nice weekend series against Alabama and Fayetteville. Six thirty first pitch at. Um, and Baum Walker against Alabama Friday, March 31st, Saturday, April 1st at 2 o'clock, and then Sunday, April 2nd at 2 o'clock. All these games are on – well, excuse me, not all of them. The first two games, SEC Network Plus, and then the series finale is at, on uh, SEC Network. And then you got Arkansas State and Fayetteville. I would definitely encourage you guys to follow Andrew Ellis at Andrew Ellis 24 7 on Twitter if you haven't done so already. Read his content at hogsports.com. Does a great job covering Razorback baseball. Should Ricky Council stay or go? Now, for those people talking about, um, I mean, Ricky Council and Trevon Brazil are probably the two biggest questions. Brazil obviously coming off a knee injury. I would think that Brazil should probably come back. He may get drafted off potential. But I would think that Brazil could come back. Those wondering about, like, Anthony Black or Nick Smith Jr. I mean, say Anthony Black's the 10th pick in the NBA draft. His first year, he's making guaranteed $4 million. And guaranteed the second, guaranteed the third, and then the option comes in the fourth year. But And it, and it escalates each year. Anthony Black's not picking up $4 million in IL money at Arkansas. Okay, this isn't like a improve your draft stock. He's already being talked about as a top ten guy. Same thing, you know. Same thing with Nick Smith Jr. So anybody like holding out hope that those two guys are coming back, you should stop. They're they're going to the NBA, and they should. They're going to be multimillionaires. Go to the NBA. When you have players like that that make it to the NBA, it makes your program more appealing to the next group of guys that come through. The question is with Ricky Council, Trevon Brazil, should they come back? I mean, we're talking more second round for Council. That's maybe something to watch. I don't think that either – I think Brazil will come back, but I don't think Black – or excuse me, Council will come back just because we haven't really seen guys – that are older players that are deemed to have maybe borderline NBA potential, definite, definite pro potential overseas or what, whatever. Uh, we haven't seen guys come back. And the reason is because of potential and it's important to like get your pro career started if you're able to do that. And I think that's what we'll see with Ricky Council. I think there are a lot of things that he can improve on, but potential. These guys get their pro career started. Flipping back over to football, the NCAA is tinkering with rule changes again that nobody cares about. Uh, I thought Josh Pate had a great take on this. Where are all the people saying, man, these games need to be shorter? They're like they're trying to shorten the game. Where are all the people going shorten the game? It's a great take by Josh, Josh Pate. Nobody's saying that. Nobody wants shorter football games. Maybe we want less commercials, but they're not going to do that. They're not going to do that. The breaks between change of possession are too long. 
They are. They're two. Long. They're like three minutes long every time there's a change in possession. Uh, anytime they have an opportunity to go to a commercial break, they take it, and it slow. It just slows the game down uh, way more than stopping the clock on first downs. So that's what they're talking about removing: stopping the clock on first down. It's not going to make a major impact because there's plenty of ways to stop a clock. You can go out of bounds. You have an incomplete pass. Uh, but if you get a first down. No more stopping the clock until the ref stop, uh, snaps the ball, which is how it's been since 1968. So 44 years ago, <laughs> and now we're going to change that. I, and, and the NBA, the NFL does that. And as long as they keep, you know, two minutes left before the half, before the end of the game, and they stop the clock, then then okay, I get that. But I don't know. I don't. Who wants a shorter game? Like all these efforts to shorten the game. They're also going to take out uh, consecutive timeout. So if you call timeout, you can't call timeout right after that. And that's probably more to stop the icing the kicker stuff where you see a you know, coach you may burn all three timeouts right before the half. I'm fine with that one, actually. I get a little annoyed with those. Got something in my eye. Um Untimed penalties, rules violations that occur with no time on the clock in the first and third quarters would carry over to the next quarter, thus limiting untimed downs to the end of halves. Replay adjustments during games, which there isn't a replay official in the booth, on-field officials will have the option to replay in which they can use available video after a coach's challenge. Some of these replays last too long also. That's maybe another thing that they could put a time limit on or something. But sometimes that's, that's what takes – too long so anyway a few rule few rule changes coming up they haven't been officially adopted but they're going to be they're going to adopt those who are you pulling for in the ncaa tournament you pulling for uconn since they beat arkansas or are you like, are one of those guys that are like ah, i hope they lose UConn is playing so well right now, though. I mean, who would have thought you'd have this this group? San Diego State, five seed. FAU, nine seed. Miami, five seed. UConn, four seed. All the number one seeds faltered. Purdue got bounced in the first round. Houston got bounced by Miami, convincingly, 89-75. Kansas put up a fight, obviously, against Arkansas, but fell 72-71. Arkansas just picked them apart. Second half, tore their defense up. What was the other one seed? Purdue, Kansas, Houston, oh, Alabama. I know you guys hated seeing the SEC brethren fall. <laughs> mm. You know, Eric Musselman has never lost – at Arkansas, he's never lost to a, a team seated below him. Never lost, never been upset in the NCAA tournament. I think that's pretty remarkable. Two Elite Eights, a Sweet 16. Obviously, one tournament was canceled. So, he's, out of the three that they've been able to go to, two Elite Eights and a Sweet 16. And did it with this group. And I don't think a lot of us thought that they were going to make any noise. A lot of people probably picked them losing to Illinois in the first round. Definitely to Kansas in the second I doubt many of you had Arkansas beating Kansas in the second round. So it was cool to see them get to the second weekend. You know, I've always said to have a great season, you have to do two things. You have to, you know, win a lot of games, obviously, in the regular season, and you got to make some noise in the NCAA tournament. If you don't do both, it's not a great season. It's not a great season if you don't do both. Because I don't care, like, how good Purdue's season was. If you get bounced in the first round as a one seed, you're a joke. Everybody's making fun of you. Everybody's laughing about it. I'm sorry. Like, you had a great regular season. You got bounced in the first round to Fairleigh Dickinson. That ruins that, – I'm sorry, it ruins the whole season for you. This is an interesting article. It's like breaking down. Should we have seen it? They're saying they should. They saw Purdue coming from a mile away. We had a text, like obviously we got a group thread of me and Curtis, Andrew, Danny talking about it. And I, I texted the group, you know, basically hoping for Curtis to respond. Um, 
because he knows, you know, everything about that. But I was like – I was looking at Purdue's roster when I was filling out my bracket and stuff. I was looking at the roster, looking at the stats, numbers, and everything. I'm just like, how is Purdue good? I mean, they got one guy, National Player of the Year. And Curtis like, they got one guy who can dunk without leaving his feet. But their guards are sketchy. And, and we were all talking about it. Um, and this verdict is saw that one coming from a mile away. With Houston, their loss was random. Kansas, their loss to Arkansas was random. Got a great breakdown this article. This is uh, The title of this article is NCAA Tournament 2023. A historic debacle from number one seed. Should we have seen this coming? But it's got a lot about uh, uh, the Kansas-Arkansas game in here and what Arkansas did to win the game and basically the out-tough Kansas, which was hard to see. Alabama, not as random as you think. Check that article out. It's on 24-7 Sports. Ten quarterbacks destined to silence critics during 2023 season. This doesn't include Arkansas, but I thought this was an interesting read also. Uh, I just want to talk about a couple of guys because they're uh, coming up on the schedule for Arkansas. Caden Slovis at BYU, who was at USC, who was at Pitt, and really has – I mean, this guy – has gotten progressively worse throughout his career. It's kind of interesting to to see uh, how far he's kind of dropped down. But he's at BYU now. His freshman year at USC, the starting quarterback, he was 282 of 392 passing, 71.9%, 3,502 yards, 30 touchdowns, nine interceptions, 167.6 efficiency rating as a freshman at USC. The next year, he's 144.1 efficiency, only 1,900 yards, 17-7 and seven on touchdowns and interceptions. And the next year, he's 132.7, down even further. The last year at Pitt, he transferred to Pitt, and he goes 184 of 315 for 58.4%, 2,397 yards, 10 touchdowns, 9 picks, 127.1 efficiency rating. His efficiency rating has dropped like – in most years, 10 points, but the last year went from 132 to 127. But that's a pretty significant – like, how do you go from freshman and just continue to drop like that? Anyway, he'll be vying for the starting job at BYU. And Arkansas obviously plays BYU week three, I think, or week two. I can't remember. Week two or three. The other guys I wanted to look at, Jackson Dart – at Ole Miss because Ole Miss brought in Spencer Sanders and Walker Howard. Two pretty – I mean, Ole Miss's quarterback room is is pretty nice. It's all transfers. Walker Howard was at LSU. He was the number 40 ranked overall prospect in the country in the class of 2022. So, he's a young guy. He was just a true freshman – or, you know, redshirt freshman last year. Number five quarterback in the country. And the other guy is Spencer Sanders. Spencer Sanders was at Oklahoma State. I mean, this guy – He's had a couple of years where he's ran for over 500 yards. He goes for like 2,600 yards, 500 rushing yards, basically, like average over four years. And basically, he's just looking for a different challenge. That's why he left. But that's a pretty interesting three-way battle there. So a couple of interesting quarterback situations on Arkansas's uh, upcoming opponents. Here's another one with nobody at Arkansas, but – you know, kind of related college football power five assistants facing elevated pressure in 2023. There's three. I'll give you give you a guess. Kendall Bryles, TCU offensive coordinator, quarterbacks coach. I mean, Kendall's going to have a hard time replicating what TCU did last year. There's going to be a lot of pressure on him in that regard. They don't have the quarterback, obviously. Um, they went to the college football playoff. That's a lot to live up to uh, after what happened the year before they lost their offensive coordinator to uh, to Clemson and Garrett Riley. So, him, obviously. Uh, Dow Loggins at USC uh, – USC – USCE. Dow Loggins. I mean, he goes from – you know, Dow obviously struggled in the NFL as a coordinator and then last year – was a tight ends coach at Arkansas. So that seems like a pretty big step up to go from tight ends coach, even though it's, it's really not for him, uh, to go to South Carolina. 
South Carolina won eight games last year. It's just with Dow, it's just on the South Carolina side of things, it was just a very heavily scrutinized hire at the time. They did not want them. I mean, like you go to their message boards, when Dow Loggins' name's popping up at the top of the list, they did not want him there. Now, they warm up, obviously, like you would, but he's definitely got a lot to prove. The last guy is Bobby Petrino at Texas A&M. I just think this is a a very strange marriage with uh, Jimbo Fisher and Bobby Petrino. I'm going to try to create an environment as toxic as humanly possible. <laughs> but, <laughs> I mean, did Jimbo Fisher just hire his replacement? It's possible. I mean, Jimbo Fisher has got to win this year or he will be fired and not just like fired at the end of the year. They will fire him midseason if he doesn't win. Five and seven season last year. Everybody's talking about him going to be this and that. So, Bobby Petrino coming in, he's going to call plays. Obviously, you would. You wouldn't bring him in as just a figurehead coordinator. That would have been even stupider. I don't know if you guys paid attention to Aaron Nolan. He's probably the top quarterback that Arkansas is in on right now. Uh, but he just dropped his top seven, which includes Arkansas. And, you know, talks about all the schools that he's interested in. And the reason it's significant, because, like, top seven, you're like, top seven, really? You're talking about a top seven. Uh, and I'm always of the opinion, like, if you're going to drop a top list, drop a top five. You know, if you drop a top six, you're just, like, you you seem very undecided to me. Like, uh, But his top – the reason it's significant is because he's making a final decision, a commitment – You never say final anymore, but he's making a commitment on April 8th. So we're less than two weeks away from him making a decision from this top seven. Ohio State, Miami, Texas A&M, Alabama, Clemson, Arkansas, and Oregon. Just recently visited Arkansas. Talks about all the schools, why he likes them at all. Uh, You can read that. That title is Top 247 QB Air Nolan Drops His Top Schools by Steve Wiltfong. You can read that article. Um, But – you know, if, if it's not Air Nolan, then, you know, K.J. Jackson might be the next guy. He'd probably be the next guy in line. So we'll see what happens on April 8th. If Arkansas doesn't get Nolan, then we'll see them probably put the full court press on, on K.J. Jackson, which would be kind of cool to have K.J. Jefferson and K.J. Jackson. Air Nolan is the number 55 overall prospect in the country, number seven quarterback, number eight overall in Georgia. And, of course, we just mentioned his top seven there. What else? Danny's got a good breakdown uh, on all those guys. K.J. Jackson's no slouch. I mean, 6'3", 215, number 17th ranked quarterback prospect in the country also. So, it's not like, you know, it's not like he's some kind of slouch. He's a big-time quarterback. North Carolina, Arkansas, maybe the top schools to watch for him. But Danny breaks down, you know, Quarterback position, the top running backs that they're looking at. This is the latest update of the Big Red Recruiting Board, which came out today. One of the other things that I think really separates what we do at Hog Sports from from anywhere else, uh, just not just like a list of guys that they've offered, but where things really are, who's reciprocating interest. And Danny breaks all that stuff down, keeps it regularly updated, uh, but breaks down you know all the top running back prospects that they're in on hot, warm, cool, all those different levels. Uh, wide receivers obviously broken down on this loop group. There's a lot of wide receivers. Arkansas is in some good shape with a lot of these guys. And um, tight end, offensive line, that's just on the offensive side. He'll come out with the de- – usually follows up pretty quickly with the defensive side. All right, one last time. I'm going to go to some questions here. But before we get to those, I want to remind you one more time, if you haven't left us a five-star review – Just take a moment and do that real quick. It helps the channel so much when you do that. Leave us a five-star review. uh, Share the content with other people. The show is always streaming on Facebook Live. If uh, you don't watch on Facebook Live, you can always catch us immediately after that on YouTube. Um, Be sure to throw us a thumbs up or a like on both of those platforms and leave a comment, interact with the video, and, of course, leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts if you haven't taken a moment to do so. Billy Harper says, hey, Trey, appreciate the stream. Appreciate you tuning in, Billy Harper. Appreciate all of you guys for joining in. Appreciate our subscribers, of course. We would not be able to do what we do, this show, any of that, without you guys. We also appreciate our more casual um, free users. But if you're a diehard fan, you really need to sign up for a dollar. Like, what are you doing? It's a dollar. Sign up. Check us out. 
be glad you did. Justin Williams says this March Madness has been the the best ever that I've seen. Crazy. It has. I mean, it has lived up to the name. Like, we don't have a bunch of blue bloods. Really, the only program you would consider a blue blood that's in there is UConn. I don't know. Has UConn been a blue blood lately? They've always been good. Blue blood's a pretty hefty title. I would say I'd put UConn in that category, though. Robert James says, hey, man, y'all should have Porter Hayes on to talk some Arkansas Razorback softball. I don't know who that is, but we're not going to talk much softball. We just we mainly just cover football, basketball, baseball. Like, and the reason is, you know, just because traffic numbers say we can't dedicate our time there, and should we take away from our football time, our basketball, or baseball time, and dedicate it to you know something else that, you know, I think all those it's great to get all those things coverage, but the numbers are just show that people don't. Don't read like you got to be. There's got to be an interest, you know. And I'm not saying there's not interest, especially when it comes down to it. But for us, for what we do, there's just, you know, we dedicate our our efforts to other, other things. And we make it pretty clear that that's what we do. Bill Richards says, "Appreciate the job you're doing with the Hogs. What players do you think will come back for the Razorback basketball next year? It sounds like from Mama Mitchell, like the Mitchell twins may come back." Um, it would be nice. I think I think Ricky Council would be a really nice addition to come back. I don't think he will. Trevon Brazil, since he's coming off the knee injury, I think it makes all the sense in the world for him to come back. Um, aside from that, Debo, love for Debo to come back, obviously. I think he will. Um, I mean, he's not a guy that's going to enter the transfer portal. And aside from that, I'm not. Sh- I, th- I think you're just going to see a lot of transfer additions. You know, you got the two signees. I don't think they're going to sign anybody else. Obviously, um, I think the work's going to be done in the transfer portal about how this team looks next year. What I would love to see them do is get some guys that can really shoot the ball. Like that was a big glaring weakness for this team was being able to shoot the three ball. Um. Joseph Pinion, I think, could possibly come back. I think Darren Ford probably be a guy to watch. Um, Barry Dunning, I think, probably makes a lot of sense for him to enter the portal. We'll see how it works out, though. Um, how many years will Criswell have if he takes over next year? You mean like after this year? So he will be a red shirt junior this year. So then he would be a red shirt senior and then have a super senior year because he was a 2020 recruit. So he has, he would have, he's got three more years of eligibility remaining after 2023, 24, 25. So two years if he were to take advantage of all of them. Let's see. Questions, questions. Norman Hunt says the best – the kick returner we ever had – I assume you meant best. The kick returner we ever had, Felix Jones, fight me in the comments at least when started using him for that. I remember some controversy about that at the time. Um, they also had Darren McFadden back there. He was pretty good. Dennis Johnson is the SEC's all-time leading kickoff returner, and that's a record that will never be broken because they've done so much to discourage kickoff returns. So, Dennis John, think about this, like Arkansas special teams. Arkansas special teams have not been really elite since 2011. 2011, they had Dennis Johnson returning kickoffs, Joe Adams returning punts. He had four that year. Zach Hawker. And Dylan Breeding, I think, was first or second in the SEC in punting. (laughs) That's a hell of a special teams unit. UConn is only a blue blood for women's basketball. I don't know. How many national championships does UConn have? A few. Let's look it up. 
UConn Huskies, I mean, they're unquestionably a blue blood. I mean, like, they may be the blue blood for women's. Man, I'm going to say you if you've won four national championships, you're a blue blood. They won in 99, 2004, 2011, and 2014. That's the men's. They made the final four in 99, 04, 09, 11, 14, and 23. You win four national championships, you are a blue blood, especially when you consider that it's been in the last 25 years. Four national championships in the last 25 years, 24 years, really. But I'm, I'm saying UConn is a blue blood. I'm not sure how they weren't a one. I mean, I look at the their conference, obviously. They've got, you know, Marquette and um, – well, who else they have in there? They have, I mean, they finished third in their conference. Who's the other team that was ahead of them? Why am I spacing on them? Another really good team that made a lot of damage in the NCAA tournament. So, um, no, Blue Blood, UConn's a Blue Blood. They have a overall better basketball tradition than Arkansas does. All right, everybody, hit that uh, – Hit that link for uh, Apple Podcasts. Just go over there and do it right now while you're thinking about it. If you're watching the show on YouTube, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, if you're on Spotify or whatever else, throw us a five-star review. We'd really appreciate it. It uh, it does a lot for the channel. All right, everybody. We'll be back with you guys next week, but uh, be sure to go to hogsports.com for all of our spring football coverage. Baseball, Curtis is going to have basketball stuff out the, you know what, I mean, it's it's portal season, like – no rest, right? So, portal season kicking off for Razorback basketball, spring football, and baseball, of course, in full swing. And as we know, college football recruiting never stops. So, check out Danny West content for that. All right, everybody, thanks for joining us. 51 minutes, starting to feel it in the voice. Went straight, no guests today. Me talking the whole time. All right, everybody, thanks for joining me. This has been Trey Biddy with hogsports.com, and we'll catch you next time. 